So the diesel lecture, or I'm going to call this video what every sailor worth his salt who has a diesel engine on his boat needs to know. Whether you are a day skipper, coastal skipper, yacht master, you name it, I consider these essential things. You should, you should know how to service your own diesel engine and you should know the four basic aspects of how diesel engines work. Namely, the lubrication, which is what we're busy with, which includes new oil every hundred hours and a new oil filter, checking the gearbox oil, adding, if it needs to be, um, generally often the gearbox oil and the engine oil is, is the same, unless it's a hydraulic gearbox. Uh, this Yanmar engine uses the same gearbox oil as the as the engine oil, proper diesel, uh, quality diesel oil. The second thing is the fuel. Nine times out of ten when your diesel engine packs up, suddenly out of the blue it's because you've got contaminated fuel or you've got water or both in the fuel and you need to know how your fuel system works and how to bleed your engine. Third thing, cooling. Coolant is one of the most important things. Remember, on most modern boats now, the car's radiator is called a heat exchanger and it's a closed system which has antifreeze in it but your engine cools the the radiator water around the cylinder heads in the engine by means of seawater so when you start your engine you always check or ask somebody to check is there water coming out my exhaust at the back and is there plenty for water supply so if not nine times out of ten it'll be you've forgotten to open the stopcock there's something blocking the stopcock, uh, there's something in your sump because the water draws from a stopcock into the sump like a swimming pool filter. From there it goes into your engine and as a third resort you might have to look at the water pump because the impeller might have broken or some, but it hardly ever happens. They, if you look after your engine, those kind of things seldom, seldom happen. And then of course the last thing is the power. How does your engine get power? Uh, so the battery, the battery selector, the battery and the starter motor. So remember, let me take you on a little journey. And while I'm on the subject, the other thing too, you can always tell if a skipper looks after his boat, the quality of his engine will be in good nick. So I'm not boasting, but you can see, I keep an eye on my, my diesel engine. And so the stopcock, this is the dedicated engine stopcock there. You can see it's open because we run the engine. So the water goes into this, into the strainer. From the strainer, it runs down and comes into the engine. There, that pipe there. It comes into the engine. And behind the pipe, there's a little plate. You can see down there, and on that plate is, that's where your, your uh, impeller is. So mostly it's because you haven't opened the stopcock or there's shit in the, in, in the strainer. Uh, seldom will you have trouble there. Fuel, in this case, um, the fuel comes from that stopcock. It goes through this primary water trap. It's a rack or filter which I've installed. I think it's one of the best water traps uh, around globally worth putting in. Then it goes through the filter, comes into the engine filter. The beauty of this uh, to self-prime you just press this a couple of times and also when you're placing the fuel filter you just press that a few times and it fills up so it's not like the old-fashioned engines where you've got a little lift pump and you have to press 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 and undo the nut on the top of your fuel filter crack the diesel get clean diesel and then follow all the cylinders in in turn if that's not working these modern engines almost are self-priming which is brilliant but let's get back to oil so this is where the where the pipe was in. I've sucked out about three and a half liters. And this is the tricky spot here. You can see this is the uh, oil filter. So it always creates a mess no matter what I do. So I'll put a towel or something underneath down in the sump and I'll still get quite a lot of oil and have to clean it up, etc. But that's just par for the course. So those are the four essential things that you need to know. How your fuel system works. Here's my, here's my battery selector by the way, so that's off, see everything goes off, that's my dedicated engine battery where I'm kneeling, this is for both, 
engine batteries and house batteries where, where they are on, on that side underneath the, that funnel. And when I turn it to two, those are my house batteries. So I always make sure that my engine battery is strong. And when I've stopped using my engine, I turn my battery selector to two so that my house batteries use all the power for um, the fridge and anything else, radar or anything else that I have on board, instruments, lights, etc. So my engine battery always remains strong, quite important. When I run the engine, I can sometimes set it on both. So now the engine is, that's got an 80 amp alternator will charge both the engine battery and the house batteries. And this smart charger that I put in when I'm at, uh, at the mooring uh, will charge both sets of batteries, the house batteries and the engine battery and keep them, I mean, keep them at a constant charge. Quite useful. But of course, when you're out at sea, you need to manage your power. So for me, what I need to do is I put the battery select on two, so the house batteries take all the power. And my fridge here uses a lot of power, although it's a compressor. And what's more, the radar here uses a hell of a lot of power. And I don't have an autopilot, I've got a self-steering wind vane at the back you can't see, but my wind generator and my solar panel uh, trickle charge both sets of batteries all the time. And my battery selector here you can see is 1394. So when the battery runs down it'll get to about 13.2 and uh, my smart charger will keep, if I'm at a mooring, my smart charger will keep the power on all batteries at about 13.2, never below that. And you can set it more if you want. So that's just a brief, a uh, brief, a brief uh, instruction or hopefully instruction manual for instruction video on what what you should do. Um, might do some more as I'm cleaning up, but you need to know your diesel engine. People call out the NSRI or the Coast Guard far too often because they got frigging sailboats and their engines don't work and suddenly they think they're at the mercy of the elements. So unless you are at the mercy of the elements, which means a mayday means grave and imminent danger to vessel or life, you don't call them out. You, you make a plan and you sail somewhere and you drop anchor and you fix the problem. Uh, and half the skippers don't ever check the engine. They don't know where the stuffing box is or their the uh, dripless seals, they don't clean the engines, they don't look after the engines, they don't service the engines and they wonder why they've got problems. That's just a personal philosophy, so you get taught that automatically when you come to the Cape Town Sailing Academy. I think it's a very important part of any day skipper, coastal skipper, yacht master course and should be taught in depth. And the basic diesel engines are all the sim similar, so it's easy to know more about the theory just go online and look under how diesel engines actually work. But the stuff I've given you is the essential stuff. You need to know how your fuel system works and can you bleed your engine. You need to know how the cooling system works and can you sort it out in case there's no water coming out and the propeller gets packed down. You need to know how your lubrication works. Gearbox oil, engine oil, replace it every 100 hours with a new oil filter um, and oil. And number four, the power. How does the power system on your boat work? Feeding the engine, etc. And then of course routine things. When I'm checking, when I'm when I when I service the engine now, I'll routinely check the fan belt, that the fan belt tension is not too loose or too tight. I'll routinely check and tighten any nuts and bolts or anything like that that I think can come undone. I'll check the hoses, I'll check the dripless seal, um, you know, all the stopcocks, etc. Just as a matter of principle. I keep all the stop locks on the boat closed, with the exception of the self-draining ones here in the cockpit behind us. But everything else on the boat gets closed, unless I'm running the engine, in which case the engine stop clock is open. So, yeah, I think safety is important. I, uh, this boat is, is, is registered offshore, and she goes quite far offshore sometimes, quite far offshore. And uh, you need to have a boat that you know and can rely on, and you need to have an engine above all that you can rely on. One of the main reasons is that we here in Cape Town, we get hectic winds like today, 
the winds are well over 30, 40 knots. I'll just show you the mountain. Um, and you can hear it. You can see the the the, the spray in, in Duncan Dock. I mean, look at this. So the wind is about 35, 45 knots. So, sailing in Cape Town is, uh, if you can sail here, you can sail anywhere. So, um, I get a lot of students that come from overseas and come here. We sail all year round, which is quite useful. So, if you want to know anything more, just go onto the website, www.capetownsailing.co.za. Uh, send me an email and, uh, and we can chat. Yeah. Hope you found the video enjoyable and informative. Cheers. Good morning guys. Um, I haven't posted a video for quite a while, but I think this one's very important. I think at day skipper level and definitely at coastal level, in fact both, uh, it's essential that your skipper, or when you do your coastal or day skipper course, part of your practical lecture yeah. or one of the lectures yeah. should be yeah. Yeah. Uh, routine maintenance on a diesel engine and four things that you need to know so the first thing I'm dealing with today this engine is just over she's on just around about 600 hours four years ago I put it in she had 35 hours on the clock I change uh, I do a routine maintenance every hundred hours so one of the first things I'm doing is the first things I'm doing is the uh, lubrication, which means gearbox oil, checking the gearbox oil, seldom has to be replaced. And the second thing is the engine oil must be replaced. So engine oil is liquid gold to a diesel engine. Let me repeat that. Engine oil and a new oil filter every time, every hundred hours, is liquid gold to a diesel engine. So she's done just over 100 hours since the last service and I let the engine run for about 15-20 minutes to warm up the oil so it all settles down into the sump and I engage her in forward for a while, put a neutral then I engage her in back into reverse for a while so that the engine really, really works. I mean diesel engines like to work. So on this boat I replaced an old Tempest Commodore British BMC uh, marinized tractor stroke uh, car engine with this Yanmar 4JH4 75 horsepower 16 valve beautiful engine and touch wood she's not given me a day's trouble the engine hasn't at any rate I mean, I won't talk about the shaft and the top shaft and the stuffing box and all that shit but what I'm doing here now is I've warmed up the engine. So this is one of those suctions. You can see how the oil is coming up. Going to two and a half already. This will take a slow process. Slowly, slowly catch your monkey. Don't rush it. Just slow pumping regularly, you can hear. And we'll let it go and we'll let it go. And sooner or later, we'll have about three and a half liters of diesel up. It takes about three and a half liters of diesel new and uh, yeah that's the first step so I'll continue once I've finished pumping up so I spoke about the messy job I put an old towel underneath there so I've, and I've used this monkey wrench to undo this is the new oil filter that's the old one still full of oil so it's always messy you can see this is the old one so what's important is that this little rubber seal here you need to give it a little bit of oil and here the thread inside there to make your job so much easier. So what I normally do is I just use a little bit of oil from the old, from the old, uh, the old uh, filter just to lubricate that, that thread and I'll take a little bit of oil and I'll just lubricate the seal so that it doesn't ever have a tendency to seize up or etc. So 
just useful little tips like that and remember you don't need to over tighten these things okay I generally use my hand and maybe a little bit more just one torque on the monkey wrench but nothing more so this is the new oil filter that's going to go back in so the other essential thing I forgot to mention is always carry plenty of spares for your engine from fan belts to oil filters to air filters to uh, fuel filters to oil like for example here you can see I've got two five liters of uh, this one here is 15W40 uh, which is general good diesel engine heavy duty diesel engine oil um, yep all those kind of things and you can see we've taken out about three and a half liters each one of these here is one liter so one two three three close on three and a half liters we managed to get out with this suction um, you can't get all the oil out unfortunately but uh, that's sufficient I think the engine takes about three and a half maybe 3.6 liters of oil okay cheers important not to put too much oil in so if you look at your dipstick dipstick's got two lines minimum maximum you should never try and put more than the top line in so this is the dipstick I'll just dry it out so if you can see before I put the oil in you see those lines you can see those lines there so the oil should never be above that bottom line there it should never be higher than that okay that's what we're looking at so I'm not sure if you've got a good good angle I'm trying to find places to so you can hear the engine oil still running in so let's just have a look She's still, still going to take a while. So she's running down into the engine, and I'll just leave it for a while to see how much oil. Because we've given, we're down to two and a half, five. So we're down to two and a half. Yeah, we're not. That mark is three liters. So I could go. more there we are two and a half about three and a half that should be sufficient so we'll check that out and see how we go always damage myself on the freaking boat half of the course but part of the fun I know that I'm doing my diesel engine a huge favor by doing what I'm doing and I know that my diesel engine will be eternally grateful for changing the oil in the oil filter regularly it's given me nearly 600 hours of running free service uh, it's been wonderful one of the best engines I've ever used uh, on the whale boat just as a matter of interest if you remember I had a 32 foot steel boat and that photograph and if you remember that was intrepid when the whale landed us that was 18th of July 2010 that happened I'm behind the helm my ex-partner is tucked away to the right you can't see her that whale was still on the way coming up he hit the mast just below the Saints right hand there mast came down and uh, we're both lucky to be alive if he'd come over the cockpit that had a I'm strain but if you're interested just Google whale lands on Intrepid and you'll see the whole thing. 
But that engine on that steel boat was a Yanmar 3G30, which was directly sequel. It didn't have a heat exchanger like this one. But it also had a mechanical gearbox like this one. And a fantastic engine. So I cut my teeth, basically, on the Yanmar. Uh, I think they're great engines. I think the parts in South Africa are hellishly expensive, that's the only thing. So we're always sourcing uh, other fuel filters, other, other oil filters, fan belts, anything else. Because the Yanmar parts, I think, are hellishly overpriced. And our RAND is not particularly strong, so we take strain when we have to import parts from overseas guys in Europe and America have it easy. Your currency is strong and uh, you can afford these things but you know in South Africa it's pricey so uh, yeah be that as it may. Anyway so we can check the fuel I mean the uh, oil again. So guys I've done the engine service greased wherever I need to grease etc so I mean the beauty of this is I've created a lot of space when I first got the boat and gradually over the years I've made lots of space around here so I can work on the engine quite quite nicely. Open it up on both sides as you can see all around me. Now you can see I've greased the, the dripless seal. Now what I want to do is this little this little uh, nut um, takes silicon grease so I'm going to just unscrew that put some more silicon grease in and then close it off um, and then one last thing I need to check are these bolts here there's four bolts here which lock the universal joint to the gearbox coupling you see there's not much space there and on the weekend we had a mishap that those bolts came undone and I think it's because there was too much grease and these are nylock which are old nylock and I think I will gradually, I'm going to replace them and put uh, new nuts on with Loctite um, to avoid that potential problem. See on this coupling I can put double nuts on to lock them in place, but here there's no space. So when the shaft turns, you can see there's very little space here. I can only fit one nut, so, um, and I'm not going to use nylon, nylocks or whatever they call those things. Uh, so I'm going to use a traditional nut, maybe with a spring washer, but I'm going to use Loctite. And that should make, uh, make for a safe, safe passage. So the last thing on the agenda for this afternoon's engine service is I'm going to replace that pipe there with a T-piece with one solid with one solid pipe from the engine seawater stopcock up to the bottom of the strainer. There's the piece of black pipe there, I'm going to use it because it's leaking and we don't need that T-piece anymore because the T-piece now fits here on the other side of the engine and uh, on this side of the um, anti-siphon pipe. So what happens is when the engine's running and you're engaging gear, the water's coming through here and it goes along that green pipe to the top of the Vita stripless seal so it pumps water in there and it keeps the shaft cold so I've just replaced uh, I put more silicon uh, grease in, in that little nipple everything's fine that's all sorted out there so the last remaining thing there to prevent these leaks is just to change that pipe um, and then we are done for the day you can see it drips every now and then there it is. So it's really irritating. See it's dripping quite a bit. So I'm fed up with having water in the freaking bulges when I've got a dripless seal. I put up with it when I had the stuffing box before I hit that undersea underwater log at the beginning of December. But I'm fed up with having any other leaks. And as far as I'm concerned you shouldn't have those kind of leaks there. So I'm going to redo that whole thing and sort it out. And that's it. So I hope you've learned something. You can see how much space I've got here. I can open that panel even comes out if I need to work more on the engine. Um, these are the these these are the stop um, the cockpit drains, two into one, and there two into one there, which go into this pipe. And uh, yeah, 
that's it so the engine's looking good um, I've checked all nuts hoses um, I've checked the flange here with the Loctite it's working really well so I'm just going to grease that flange a little bit but other than that things are working really well okay so hopefully that was an entertaining entertaining uh, uh, lecture for you and I hope that uh, if you have any questions please you know, look me up or send me messages etc and come sailing with us when you're in Cape Town. Cheers.